No gotcha journalism? No, no, I'm, I'm very much... I was much... hoping to get got. Sorry. No one ever gets me. <laughs> that might just be a, a problem in life overall, but... That's, yeah, uh, I mean, it's deeper. We don't have time for that. We, we, we have to pay we, for yeah, I'll get exactly. a box of tissues and we can really, uh, you know, work this out. Welcome to Carpool Event, folks. In New England, we are very lucky to have some great sports happening in our area. Uh, teams that win championships, thanks to great ownership and, and everything else that goes into it, hardworking athletes. Uh, and it probably, I would assume, is any sports journalist's dream to work in this market. Well, somebody who had a dreams come true, a, a hometown dream come true, Mr. Michael Hurley of CBS Boston. Uh, you're a writer, you're a blogger. Writer, well. blogger, talker, annoying person, all you, the things. You do fine, you do great. And uh, and how we connected, you were actually periscoping yes. after a game. Uh, I shamelessly said, hey, uh, I would love to drive my Camry through the ultimately incredibly smooth streets of Boston. Oh yeah. Talk to you about your career and what you do. Uh, and, and you graciously obliged. So well, thank you I'm for available. popping I'm in. I'm available, and, uh, I was joining 2016 by periscoping that's, uh, for the first time. So. It was a good year for periscope, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. And so I'm just trying to catch up. You know, that's that's the story of my life, trying to catch up. So you have been at CBS Boston. You're a you're a writer primarily. Yeah. And then you you go on different shows. I know you're on the Sports Up from time to time. You're on different radio shows, probably throughout the country. You do yep. a lot of interviews, giving your takes. Talk to me a little bit how you got into working in this field, you know, you, where you're from and, and how you ended up at uh, BZ in Boston. So yeah, I'm from Arlington, not too yeah. far from Boston. Obviously grew up following all the Boston sports. I went to school down in Rhode Island, actually at uh, Roger Williams. Uh -huh. uh, so when I graduated in 08, it was sort of the internet as a media industry was sort of lost. It was sort of, it, was, it existed obviously, but it yeah. wasn't anything like it is today. There were sort of four or five websites that covered the team, and now there's four million. So, right. um, getting a job wasn't—I uh, don't know. I thought I always thought I'd have to go to like Alabama and cover high school football, and then go to like Memphis and cover maybe college sports, and then slowly build up. But it was just—it worked out to be the right time uh, to get into it, where sort of the inexperienced sports guy could get a job. So I got a job at Ness in, in January, actually before Super Bowl. Was it the Steelers and Cardinals? I started the day after that Super Bowl in okay. February of '09. Uh, worked there for three years. Ended up going to CBS, where I've been now for I lose track. I'm not good at math. I think seven and a half years. Yeah. But call it seven plus years. So uh, just kind of lucked out with the timing. I think kids these days have a tougher entry than than I did, just because there was some sort of vacancies that need to be filled then. So sure. I'm well, ride so it as long as I can. So you've been in this market for over a decade, and I've had folks that are journalists or reporters in the car before and you know it's it's always that that question i always okay what what markets did you were you in before you ended up in providence or rhode island uh, yeah. or massachusetts or wherever uh but you went right from bristol zone roger williams university beautiful bristol rhode island and uh which i live in warren rhode island oh, so next I, door, so. did i live in warren one year i think i did, did you? Yeah, right across the bridge right yeah yeah, well, yeah. no that's that, oh, well, yeah. oh warren's the other way okay. yeah, yeah i ate a lot of fast food in warren yeah but that's that's what we're known it's for where you go. it's Thank you. So proud of Medicare. They had a dollar Big Mac deal one year, and it was like, could you not? Because I'm going to get a Big Mac every day for a dollar. I'm in college. Could, glad that we could help play a role yeah. in, in that with uh, having that McDonald's for you. I powered through it. Yeah, well, you did a great job. So, a um, lot but of I did. I did. Uh, so, the fall, I did at Roger Williams. I covered all the school for the paper and everything like that. I interned at WPRI in the sports department. Okay. Um, and then I graduated and I, I thought I had a good resume and I get a job and just nothing was there. So I lifeguarded that summer. Uh, and then that fall, uh, I got connected through different, actually another Roger Williams connection. And I was covering high school sports in the greater Boston area. I was covering oh, cool. Woburn High School football, Littleton High School football, a uh, bunch of soccer teams. I had to cover a field hockey game, which I had a Wikipedia of the rules before I went to cover it. <laughs> I did a very great job interviewing that coach after the game. Like. Uh, Girls really played hard out there. Huh? It was, I was struggling that game, but uh, I covered some high school hockey, and then the opportunity arose and ended up at Nesson, which was a good spot to land and sort of get started. If you think about it, you really got into the this industry you know, out of college, right when Facebook was going from you had to have an EDU at the end of your email yep. address to everybody. Uh, Twitter was becoming bigger. Uh, 
Instagram hadn't started quite yet, but right. like all these different methods have come yeah. while you've been in there. Um, and you mentioned there's a lot of people, you know, vying for that position, jockeying to try to get a gig. Um, what is kind of your, I don't want to say what is your secret sauce, what is your, <laughs> what is your formula for now um, just having that constant uh, staying on top of the game and staying, you know, relevant with everything? Yeah, I mean, I, I always try to, I think early on I, I tried to, it sounds really like pretentious to say. So in a non-pretentious way, I tried to like establish a voice and okay. just sort of speak the way I speak, try to write the way I talk, okay. because I was just looking at the way talk radio works and the way personalities work and you like certain guys, you don't like certain guys. And, and you know, like there, there's people in the media that you enjoy more than others. And, and it basically comes down to like a, a means of communication. Uh, right. And so I always tried to write honestly, uh, not just, you know, drum stuff up for attention, uh, you know, try to just sort of be me uh, in a way that a little, maybe like a little, a little amplified version of myself because I'd be kind of boring otherwise. But, uh, you know, always try to be interesting. You always have to try to think of different ways to attack things. And frankly, uh, uh, getting a foothold during the deflate gate thing was a big, a big boost. I appreciated the deflated footballs more than sure. anyone else. But... Uh, yeah, actually, uh, if I'm correct, I believe Toucher and Rich actually interjected your name into uh, a song I got about a Roger song. Goodell. Yeah, I, I got, won't really go into it. Got Hurl, Baby Hurl. <laughs> it's uh, the uh, ruin Michael Hurley, I believe, was the exact reference. Yeah, but, what an uh, honor. It was a true honor. But uh, <laughs> no, that was, I mean, that was kind of, I always look at that as like, it was good for me, but it was also kind of sad for like the media, the state of media, yeah. because the only thing I did to differentiate myself during that time was... Uh, like just read yeah so if like 40 pages came out i would i would read them and then kind of distill down into maybe like a three page summary what happened which i think anyone with you know a brain was capable of doing but not many people were doing which was kind of discouraging you know like yeah it's uh not that i didn't have any special talent there other than just having maybe an hour to do the work right uh which other people didn't really weren't interested in doing so it, it worked out for me but i always still feel kind of bummed out about that You've had a front row seat for the last 10, 11 years at some of the most amazing victories in sports all across the board. Obviously, you get to work with the likes of like Dan Roach, mm -hmm. uh, Joe Giza, mm -hmm. who incidentally threw out one of the best first pitches at Paul Sock. I think I saw that on Twitter, maybe? Uh, yeah, uh, he, was, he did a great job. Much better than Dan Roach because I've never seen Dan Roach at McCoy Stadium, which I'm... I thought he threw it out this year. Oh, that was in Lowell. My bad. Yeah, the, my I, what, what, where, where, where's Lowell? My Doesn't bad. Doesn't even matter. It's my bad. We have three A's. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm just saying. Triple A. Triple A, okay? It's, it's so my bad. Maybe, maybe he wants to make it happen. I don't know, but uh, we'll, we'll leave that aside. I'll let him know. We'll, you know we'll gently, uh, if gently if he could pull it. himself away from Disney for a, a weekend. He's got some days. <laughs> it happens. But uh, you have been... Uh, right there on, you know, you've been at Super Bowls, you've been at these big games and everything. What is that like getting, you know, to, to be part of that? You grew up in this yeah. area and now you're living the dream. It's insane. Like, there's no other way to say it. And uh, I was able to cover, I've covered two Stanley Cup finals. I've covered, what, four Super Bowls? Is that right? I don't know. Math is hard. Yes, four Super Bowls, uh, one of which was probably the greatest one I ever played maybe two of which were two of the greatest I've ever played sure. in Super Bowl 49 and Super Bowl 51. Um, I've covered, I haven't covered an NBA Finals, but I have covered two World Series, and it was really the 2013 World Series where it kind of like stunned me because I'm, I'm in Fenway Park. They put the auxiliary press box out in right field, yep. and I grew up going to Fenway Park. My dad would, you know, pick us up from work and go get tickets for like $7. Not that I'm that old, right. but like you could go to the Red Sox in the 90s and just park for 10 bucks and get right. tickets for seven bucks and have decent seats and see the Red Sox. It's a totally different world. Sure. Uh, so it's not like I, I didn't have access to Fenway, but I was never going to World Series games. I think I had been as a paying customer to like two playoff games in my life. Right. Uh, so to be there at Fenway when they actually won the World Series there for the first time in whatever, the, the hundred years or whatever it was, was kind of like a, a really holy crap moment. And then, you know, like I'm on the field afterwards and in the sure. clubhouse and everyone's dousing each other and champagne and beer and it's just sort of like what am I doing here so uh being there for that having a front row to that like you said it's just been absurd and I've seen the Stanley Cup one in Boston twice which 
I wasn't rooting for the Blackhawks in 13, but I said if they're going to win it, they might as well win it tonight while I'm here. Sure. So they obliged. And then this year, obviously, was a massive disappointment to be a Game right. 7 in the Stanley Cup Final. But still, I got to go to a Game 7 in the Stanley Cup Final. So just the luckiest time and position I think you could ever possibly ask for as a sports fan. That's that's great. There's this uh, the stigmatism of... You know, these kids coming out of college these days and, and kids who are just getting into the various industries, mm-hmm. they don't want to work. They, you know, they don't want to they don't want to put in the time. But that's complete opposite, whether that's true or not. Regardless, what don't people see about your gig? They see all the fun stuff, but what don't they see the hard work behind the scenes? What is that like? That's a good question. And with the with the young kids, I'd say, like, I get a lot of kids reaching out, like, for advice, you know, whether through connections or just random strangers. And it's the, it runs the gamut. I think just like ever, like there's some kids that just sort of throw a resume at you and say like, can I get a job now? And there's other kids that have done, you know, they have the initiative to do 12 different things while they're at college. And they're like sophomores in college and they're like already worried about jobs. It's like you are miles ahead of than that I was at that age. So right. uh, I think in terms of people coming in, I, would, I always say just do everything. Like okay. to me, when I was in college, I did the radio, I did the newspaper, I interned at uh, WPRI. Providence. I I wrote as much as I could. I expanded my comfort zones as much as I could. Uh, some great advice from my professor. Uh, I'll give a shout out to Ted Delaney at Roger Williams. He said, "Don't just write about the Red Sox and the Patriots because like everyone has thoughts about the Red Sox and the Patriots. Go sure. cover the women's soccer team. Go cover the softball games. Go cover you know whatever sports are around here and you know interview the athletes and interview the the coaches and keep your own stats and do all these things and." that was immense and I and I mentioned the high school sports reporting earlier that was probably the most important part of my entire development because you go to a game you know Woburn versus Reading on a Friday night you got to keep all your stats you got to you got to think about you got to prep your interviews while you're keeping those stats you got to sort of conceptualize what's happening in the game like it was all there so that when I cover Patriots game and all the stats are there for you and uh, you're dealing with people you know a little bit better it was so much easier having done basically like the 1950s version of it first, which I, I don't know that that applies necessarily in 2019 as it did in 2008, but it might. What I'm hearing you saying is is something that you know I'm a musician. I've 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 been exposed to this kind of mindset is just you know work on your craft no matter what it is, play something new, play something different. Don't don't always go for the most popular pieces, but you know build up your chops. Uh, by playing the obscure stuff and, and you know, become versatile, mm-hmm. you know, that's, yeah. Yeah. that's such a huge thing. And especially with local, because, you know, you've, you've been very lucky. You've worked hard to get there. Luck plays a little bit of a role mm-hmm. in it, but big role. you, you can establish your own name. You can establish your own brand, uh, by covering local and just kind of building your own audience. Right. I mean, I, I don't think I was getting many readers back when I was covering Wilmington soccer, uh, but the parents were reading it, and, sure. and it was—it it had to be good. It had to be right, or else I wouldn't be doing it. Granted, I was only getting forty bucks a story, so it wasn't really paying the bills. But uh, absolutely, and I think it's—it's it's like you mentioned, sort of like not just doing what you want, and not just doing what you like, and not just doing what you're good at. It's about trying to expand and push the boundaries, and, and always recognizing your faults. I mean, I'm a pretty harsh self-critic. I think that helps too. If I ever. If I ever read anything that I wrote in the past, there's a 97% chance that I hate it. Uh, and, you know, when it comes to, like, doing TV or doing radio, I, I always try to watch back or listen back and just point out some things that, that aren't right because no one else is going to do it for me. So I still uh, think I'm terrible at everything, but, uh, you know, that's sort of just the way I'm always going to think. It's, it's something I've talked about for many years is you, you got to watch the tape. Oh, yeah. I mean, you it's, see... It's not... It's not easy sometimes. You, you see these athletes, especially, you know, the Patriots, obviously we're in, you know, the, the heart of the season right now, you know, as they're getting on the plane to come back or at that night, they're being handed an iPad or whatever, oh, to, yeah. you know, with the plays, because if you don't self-review, then, then what good was what you just did? I mean, if you're not going to critique what you just did, so that's... It's uh, funny, because I was thinking about that. It was earlier this year. I think it was, they beat the Jets in week three, like 34 to 14, or yeah. uh, the Jets scored two, a, a pick six on Stidham and the, the, the muffed punt by Olszewski. And the Patriots put up 33 points, I think, uh, but they had that long lull from like the end of the first to the end of the third where they didn't score and the offense was choppy. And I remember being at Brady's press conference and like half the questions were like, what went wrong there? Like, why wasn't the offense going as smoothly? And, you know, what, what did you run into when you punted four straight possessions? And, it, and it's just so unique, I think, here 
Because anywhere else, I think when a team wins 33 to 14, it's just sort of like, ah, how great was that? How pop, fun was pop that? Pop the champagne. Yeah, exactly. Let's, let's not, you know, let's just and have a, fun. And a player with Brady's accomplishments would probably bristle at questions like that. Like, I mean, if you ever watched Peyton Manning's press conferences, but if he was asked questions like that, he'd get a little, you know, perturbed by it. So sure. it's it's sort of, I think that has somewhat permeated the, the coverage of the team and, and maybe deeper than that because we're, we're sort of used to perfection at least covering that team that it's just sort of a very unique thing that you know if that team is never satisfied then I think that's sort of a lesson to be learned I saw one uh, interview one time with uh, it was like one of those I don't want to call them fluff pieces but they do these stories that kind of talk about what athletes have done in the offseason and how they improve and one was Brady Mm -hmm. and he was working with some coach I don't remember the gentleman's name probably Tom House the throwing coach I think that was it he said he said people don't come to me to get you know 20% 20% better or 30% better right. people come to me to get 1% right. better because right. they're already at such a high level which is which is incredible you take that mentality and you apply it to your work over there at BZ and your writing and everything else that's what's going to keep you solidified in the game and locked in and, and staying on top of it right. I'm not quite 99% but maybe one day well yeah I mean it's uh, certainly doing this interview here as it's, I've driven you into God knows where we I are I think this is the last I'll ever be seen so well, at least it's uh, on video <laughs> unless we're going to the casino that's fine by me oh I, well it just so happens I saw it over you there can't so can't help but drive it's like a magnet it, it's, it is maybe that's uh, maybe that's what my car is just going <laughs> to but uh, well, my, if people want to follow you what's the best way I mean I know you're on Twitter you tweeted out a story right before we got in uh, what's the best way for people to connect with you and to, to follow you? Twitter's a good way. I always, I mean, do so at your own caution because I'm really annoying, I think, on the internet. I think I tweet uh, a little too much, a little too much, a little, especially if there's like a Thursday night football game and I'm sitting on the couch by myself and I've got no one to talk to, that's where it goes. But, I mean, I, I you know, try to keep it, try to keep it lighthearted. I think that's, that's my goal with everything is to not take it too seriously because we are talking about sports after right. all. And unless you get into the... The, the, the bad parts of like domestic violence and things like that that really sort of sap all the joy out of it. Uh, if we're just talking about throwing the ball around the field, then I try to keep it light. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's 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 good. So follow you on Twitter. Uh, you're everywhere, and and if if you want to uh, learn more about getting into the career of sports, just write you, send you a self-addressed um, envelope to the station yep. there, and you I'll check you'll it reply out. Back, and I'll say, mm, no, not good enough, no. <laughs> No, I mean, I always try to help. I I mean, there's a lot of people that reach out and just sort of are, you know, looking to follow the same path. And and I can't necessarily provide the path that works for everyone, but I try to, you know, relay my own experiences and and hopefully it works out for people. I mean, it's it's hard. Uh, Like I said, now where there's all these blogs and all these websites and all these, you know, entities and there's there's paid positions, non-paid positions is sort of like passion projects and it's like like. It's a, it's a crowded marketplace, yeah. so uh, I, I don't necessarily have the, the shortcut to stand out, but there's probably some baseline tasks you can you know work on that can at least get you in position to pounce when the opportunity arises, All right. if it arises. There you go. Uh, well, I think, I think we've done a great job at, at solidifying this to be mandatory watching Nailed it. at uh, Roger Williams University for the professor there. Who, Should be. Uh, it's, uh, this, this episode of Carpool. I think so. so. I think it'll change the future. <laughs> Michael Hurley, thank you so much for joining me in the car. Folks, follow him online, Twitter, on Facebook, everywhere you want to be like MasterCard.